everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, by the way, this title, uh, Generative AI Comes to Hollywood, our PR agents wanted me to tell you something. Apparently, you can buy your uh, place in Forbes, but this is a completely organic uh, news that uh, Forbes <laughs> titled for us, so apparently that makes a difference. Uh, my name is Panar Seyhan Demirda. I'm the co-founder of Kubrick and Seyhan Lee. And today, the presentation I will be giving to you, I am aiming to touch your hearts. I'm pretty sure that you're all very tired. It's 4 p.m. and it's the second day. So your minds are already very occupied. During my presentation, of course, I will be telling you about Kubrick and what we're doing there. But most importantly, I will be telling you the natural forces that brought me here uh, in front of you. So the story starts in 2010 to 2020. The story that I will tell is the story of an artist that accidentally found herself in the innovation days of generative AI in the epicenter in Google, in Brain, Brain Lab in Zurich, and uh, followed by an accidental circumstances, she found herself as a software developer for AI. So this was my studio in Paris. Um, I was a visual artist between 2010 and 2020. We were signing our studio's name with our first names together with another co-founder called Pinar Viola. So our studio's name was Pinar and Viola. We did several very interesting, for the first time, like creative technology projects, including this one. This is a music video that we did for Diplo in 2011. And this person is me. Uh, we used face tracking technology. We were the very first few people that used creative uh, face tracking technology for the first time. Just to give perspective, um, Snapchat came up with it in 2014. And back in the days, I used to tell myself, if I were to find like 50K somewhere, I can bring all my friends into an app where we can all chat together looking like bunnies and giraffes. I thought of Snapchat, but you know, I was like, yeah, I'm not an entrepreneur. You know, I better create. You know, regret. Uh, another uh, first that we did, it was 2016, sorry, I realize that you don't see these dates because it's lower than the podium, a podium, but there's the dates written here. 2016, we did the world's first uh, a holographic catwalk for a virtual uh, fashion line. We had our own fashion line. Uh, this was Viola, my partner. And in 2017, our IKEA collection came out where we designed 25 pieces with several different patterns. Um, and it was a loving moment. Why am I showing you these things? Because what I realized with my AI mind of today, I realized that all my work that I have done as a visual artist between 2010 and 2020 was me accelerating my algorithm and training my data set to be able to recognize the new patterns that are coming in the world of generative AI. With all the different visualization techniques from fashion patterns to furniture patterns to holographic catwalks to photo photographs, I finally had the understanding of where the technology will evolve and what is waiting for us. Which actually the convergent point, this is 2018. What happened is that I found myself in the epicenter, like I said earlier, of generative AI's uh, development in Google. The top row, uh, how many of you heard about Alexander Morvintsev? He's one of the original Gs of generative AI invention. He's the guy behind Deep Dream Model, 2015. So what happened is that Alexander Morvintsev and Chris Ola, another researcher from Google, were inquiring about how machine learning, like um, generative, uh, sorry, uh, artificial neural networks recognizes the futures of objects, future of objects, and how neural networks slowly build them. So their research yield in results as the first row, and the bottom row is my body of work as an artist. So I receive an email from Google one day saying that, hey, so we started making art with neural networks. We didn't have the world generative AI back then. We used to call it machine learning art or neural network art. And then it happens to look like what you're doing. We're not an art company. I'm paraphrasing, but you get the gist. We're not an art company, but you are an artist and you make meaning with this. So can we make a collaboration together? It was really the biggest, like, this is like the beginning of the natural force story. It was really like a light bulb in my head. I was like, in 2011, 
Apparently, I thought of Snapchat, but I failed in taking action. And this is my time in 2017, 2018. I think God is trying to tell me here because I know nothing about AI. I never even heard of it. I never witnessed it other than 2001 Space Odyssey. And here is, the, here is like the world's biggest technology company saying that whatever they invented looks like my body of work. So what happened is that I enter in some sort of an incubation period where Google and Panar and Viola, my ex-company, me and my uh, ex-co-partner, we, uh, we, uh, we delved into a world where we taught ourselves how AI works. And Alexander, he's, he was, he's the guy behind Deep Dream, he built an algorithm for us and a tool for everyone, everyone with no coding background, including me, my mother, to be able to create art that looks like our body of work with generative AI. And that really, like, during this incubation period that I worked with Google, I understood how the mind, intuitively I understood, how the mind of the generative AI parallel processing works, how iterations work, and how you can truly create, like, beauty out of sheer chaos, 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 word. But what was really interesting for me is that when I saw, like, the glitter in my mom's eyes when she started making art with generative AI, with this tool that, Google made for us. It was really like an awakening moment for me where, okay, usually making these patterns takes me like a month or a week, and then I could do it just by simply pushing some buttons and then pulling some sliders. Okay, I have to, do, I have to change what I'm doing or I have to look into other ways of self-expression. And I continued my quest for generative AI, I continued more towards video. And uh, this was a music video that I made with the generative AI artist Sofia Crespo in 2019. And I was truly, truly fascinated with our capacity to carry this art into motion pictures. Of course, like, we were so poor back then, we only had GANs and style transfers, like your kids have, like, text-to-video, you know? We didn't have any of that. We were just, we were able to, like, make cool shit with, like, two models, you know? Two and a half, okay, deep dream. So there, this idea started implanting in my head, which was like, generative AI will change filmmaking. But I, listen, I was an artist living in Europe. I never been to LA, or I don't know nothing about filmmaking, but I started feeling it in my heart that I want to do this. I want to carry this uh, into the world of filmmaking. I have a spiritual advisor. I usually talk about her during my public lectures. I was, of course, like for me, like this artist living in Europe, being able to carry this in LA and filmmaking sounded like turning an apple into a giraffe. And she was like, well, actually, the very moment you make a decision with your assertive authority, centered authority, that's the very moment you actually turn it into a crystallized reality. But the key is to never doubt yourself or to never ask how you're going to be able to make it. So talking about heart-based reality and a very personal story, what happened to me is that you all watched Interstellar, right? And you know that Christopher Nolan proved to us that the power of love can bend any reality, where the main actor could reach his daughter by bending space and time with the sheer force of love. What happened is that while I was on my way to Google I.O., were to present Infinite Patterns, my collaboration with Google. I had a stopover in New York for a few days where I met this gentleman, uh, very handsome, attractive. I fell in love. His name is Gary. He's there at the back of the room. And, um, and guess what? His background is in filmmaking. And he loves creative technologies. He has always been the first in uh, several technologies. He directed music videos for... Uh, YouTube, Bowie, he ran his own creative agency with 300 people. And by the sheer power of love, I found myself living in the United States in a span of three months in our beautiful home. And the best part was that it was during COVID, so he was stuck with me who couldn't stop talking about generative AI. What about this? What about that? Can we do this? Can we do that? Does filmmakers know this? Does it work like that? I don't understand a thing of cameras. How does it work like this? So we conjured up this reality where, what if we were to take my enthusiasm and obnoxiousness of generative AI and couple it with his uh, background in making amazingly huge, great things happen and his understanding of filmmaking and cameras? 
And that birthed our company, the mother company that developed Kubrick, Sehan Lee. Um, we were founded, uh, we founded it in 2020 with the sole mission of becoming uh, like the bridge between machine learning art back then, generative AI, and uh, the entertainment world. We did several really cool projects from medium to large size. To my knowledge, please prove me wrong, I've been saying this, this claim publicly and so far nobody said I was wrong, but to my knowledge we did the first generative AI VFX for a future, European future, called Descending uh, Mountain in 2020. You, this is their trailer, you can visit their website. We have, uh, again, GAN 2020, we didn't have anything else back then. There was actually uh, another model by Alexander Morvincev called um, Magic Zoom or Infinite Zoom. He presented it during SIGGRAPH. Uh, the code only remained online for three months and then he deleted it and we talked we asked him and we could, we could use it as well. So snippets of that you could have seen, like the trained generative AI eyes could see the generative AI in between. This is again, obviously. And in 2021, uh, we won a beautiful shiny award like the Oscars of Advertising, DNAD, with the first generative AI commercial, uh, Beko, uh, for Beko uh, European Appliance Company. We made this poetic, very be beautiful uh, film about the correlations between the human body and the nature's body. Of course, we used a GAN's beautiful transition aesthetic to show the seamless continuity uh, between these two bodies. We did several activations. It's all uh, the trained generative AI eyes can obviously see that what I'm showing you is either entirely generative AI or a beautiful marriage between live action and generative AI. This is an activation we did for the outer net in London the entertainment district. And here is another one that we did for them, humans. <laughs> and, and we did several music videos. You know, like generative AI is like, especially in its early days were weird, gooey, hard to control, but like so fun, right? It's like, I would say for you, it will be like um, red cameras in its early days, chunky batteries, annoying, hot, but it's like this revolutionary stuff, you know? So what happened is that, you know the feeling that when you become very good at something, it becomes not enough anymore? So Gary and I, we were doing like, really having a great run for AI production, but then we were like really quite restless because we wanted that, we wanted to continue making like cool shit, but wanted to have our own tool. So then like people with absolutely no knowledge of filmmaking or whatnot could like remove the entry barrier and they can make cool stuff like we are doing. But again, another decision, it's, it was our team was Gary, myself, and two full timers with a lot of uh, freelancers and none of them were developers. So you wanna technically invent something, but how are you gonna do it? You simply not in your realm, but we didn't lost hope. And one day, thanks to Connor from Pixera, we ended up at XR Studios in Hollywood. Do you guys know them? Uh, Francesca, JT Rooney, Scott Miller. They welcomed us, they gave us a tour, and it was the first time we were both on a virtual production stage. And of course, it's like majestic, and it's like very entertaining, like wow, you know, it's so grand. Hey, who's putting our tech in your tech? And they were like, no one. Like, no one has made the bridge yet. So we were like, okay, maybe we can do something fun. We can find a developer and then we can produce something cool. And during that time, we were also hearing that, like, of course, since we didn't have any understanding of virtual production, we were like, so how does this thing work? So they're like, okay, you have to render in real time because when the actor is going this way, the reality needs to go this way. So you need a game engine. It's like, how much? Like minimum price of a scene in a game engine, 150K goes up to infinite. And there are several different scenes on an episode. So actually it's very cool, but the entry barrier is quite stiff because it's very expensive. And not everybody is born out of the womb of their mother with an expertise in game engines. So that's when the light bulb lit actually in Gary's mind. And he was like, so who's optimizing the flow of two and a half D? Because that's an option too. And they were like, well, actually for that, we need to do a few hula hoops. We need to jump between this program and that and that. And since it has like handheld rotoscoping, it takes quite some time. So we're like, you know, 
AI has diff different automation ways, so why don't we bundle several different AIs together in order to optimize this flow for virtual production? And in 2022, winter, between summer and winter, we work with XR Studios. They gave us the sandbox for us to play with. We were like, does this work? Does that work? Does this work? And they were so patient in giving us feedback to develop our tool better. And um, December 16, we announced the world that Hey guys, like two lollipops. Hey guys, we made this tool, you know, what do you think? And, you know, with no, like just two people and their developer, um, we received 200 emails in a span of two weeks from VFX supervisors, virtual production stages, stu film studios, um, saying that, when can I have a demo? I don't want to see it. And, um, which is like very flattering. So we were like, when we when things became serious, then we became serious too. Like, and it was like you know how fast things go. So we couldn't really have time to, like, sit and then race because I mean it's not a cheap entertainment if you're developing an AI filmmaking tool, right? It's like a it's not a cheap hobby. <laughs> so what happened is that Gary and I um, both went like all in. Whatever we saved in our life mainly him, but whatever we saved in our life, I contributed too, you know? <laughs> we went like completely all in, like followed our hearts. I mean, what if it doesn't work? We didn't think about it, it will work. Why? I say so. So let's, let's tell you, let's tell you what are our AIs. So first one, we have AI image generation. Uh, this is by the way, the look and feel of Kubrick. Uh, it's very, we're very proud of our UI. It's very simple, easy to use. We have our own Kubrick Classic, Moody, Sci-Fi. It's no longer stable diffusion. We updated to our own uh, house model. So we have our own uh, four different uh, Kubrick models. And what makes them different is that Kubrick house model usually doesn't really have a style. Kubrick Moody is more like grounded realism, grainy look, low exposure, monochromatic tones. Kubrick Classic, uh, warm, rich colors, Hollywood haze, romantic, diffuse light, and Kubrick sci-fi, more like large world shots, clean, epic realities, bless you, and uh, like more contrasty realities. As you can see the difference here. I will get back to the quality of our image generation uh, later in depth, but until then I would love to show you our AI in-painting and out-painting. So this is a workflow. Uh, currently, our tool is active and uh, people are using it. Uh, this, uh, what we are currently doing uh, is that we are eliminating what we would like to in-paint. But as of next week, we will be able to create with our brush, select the ar area in color, so then you know exactly where you would like to in-paint. So here's how our in-painting works. Today, obviously, you erase a place, uh, an olive tree. We are very very proud of our in-painting quality that I will be showing you comparisons in the next slides. And you're changing it to a, I don't know, cherry blossom tree. And you're getting a great result. Uh, I don't like to compare and I don't like to compete because I know that rising tides lifts all boats. But if ever you did something great, you know, it's nice to talk about it. Um, this is the prompt for in-painting, small plastic pool filled with water. It's not always, but for some cases when it has to do with perspective, when it has to do with respecting the color spectrum and with shadow, to the next best comparison, our in-painting yields to better results. I don't know what you prefer, but I like that little <laughs> pool filled with water. And here is another one. This is the original, and this one is the result. All right, and this will be uh, uh, online as of next week, Monday, in, in the tool. So AI semantic segmentation. How many of you are familiar with semantic segmentation, automatic segmentation? Yep, 5%, great. <laughs> this is an amazing uh, technology, which has to do with being able, so this is your mechanical robot in the desert landscape. And you know, in order to go from 2D to 2.5D, you need to segment different plates, like we're we're leveled there, right? Like, we all understand. So in order to be able to do that, you need to segment the image in several different pieces. So there are different ways of doing that, but this, uh, our semantic segmentation 
allows you to push a button for the tool to tell you this is different than that, this is different than that, and that, and that, and that. And in the next months, with the uh, presence of um, a more research, we will be able to tell you this is desert and this is a robot. But right now, uh, we are currently in the research of implementing this. And uh, here is a demo. So here is how it works. And as of next week, this will be online in Kubrick as well. So you will be able to push the rock and you will be able to isolate it. The map, semantic segmentation map that I showed you here, uh, may take a couple of more weeks to be online. And our AI depth segmentation, um, you're all familiar with depth segmentation. So AI can create a depth map and we have a slider as you're seeing here. So you're pulling and pushing the slider and our tool is selecting, like imagine an invisible rope in the image. Like if you wanna cut me from here, you have to slide it here. And if you wanna cut me from here, you have to slide it further. Our super sampling, uh, there's no demo here about it, but basically let's say that this is your HD image. You can make it as large as 2% or like 4X or 8X going up to 8K. And let's give you a quick demo. So this, this demo is recorded today. So if you get into Kubrick, this can exactly be the workflow that you can experience yourself. So all the VFX artists out there, how many planes would you segment this one? Please go ahead. You're right. I would say sky. I would say sea. Mountains. Temple. And a few rocks in front. If you're overachieving. So let's do it. So you select your brush and you ideate, you isolate with different colors. I'd like to do it this way and a little bit of this way. And you're like, okay, I'm satisfied, let's go. You select semantic segmentation, and our segmentation gives you several different pieces that are cut. But let's start with the background. Okay, now that we deleted every other segment in there, we're left with the naked uh, sky, and we could in -paint it, uh, fill it with our in-painting. Let's do it to the sea. Let's remove everything Let's, let's remove every other thing so then we can leave the C behind. We have an eraser, you can erase. And let's in-paint and turn the C into a seamless C. Let's go to the third from the back, which is mountains. So as you can see, what we're doing is that we are, you can alternate for different layer, for each layer between semantic segmentation and depth-based segmentation. So we're going to do that to the mountains. Now we have our mountain layer. And of course, in order to remove the sky, at the end of the demo, you can also use your semantic segmentation to remove the sky of the depth-based segmentation that you already isolated with, and so on and so forth. And then we go to um, a temple, and then we isolate the rocks. We will be present at SIGGRAPH Tuesday at the HP booth at 10.30, where we will have a complete full demo and the plates uh, on the stage of Eric Weaver. I'm pretty sure you all know who he is. Um, and what do you do afterwards? You, of course, load it in a, a media server. This is uh, this guy's, but we are media server agnostic. You can uh, load our uh, plates on your uh, game engine or your other preferred uh, media server. This is what the camera sees in the small screen. So here is your layers. The fun part is that in the next weeks, we will be able to export depth information. What does that mean? You will no longer be required to guesstimate the distance between the mechanical monster and the desert. Our tool will be able to tell you. This is the meter, this is the inch, whatnot, and you will also have your depth map coupled with it. Of course, like, we started with the love for virtual production and generative AI, but of course, if you're an animator, you can also use it in your animations, or if you wanna uh, welcome your own DP plates, Kubrick also supports your DP plates. What we, this is, by the way, an image by Roscoe. Are you guys familiar with that matte painting library? I believe they're like one of the default matte painting libraries of the film industry. Uh, they're very kind. They have given us several of their matte paintings. And you know what we realized? AI-based segmentation methods segment real images harder. 
I still don't know why, but I would love to understand, but it's a great challenge for us. So it uh, invites us to improve our segmentation methods. And let's go back to our image generation quality. What we're very proud of is that, obviously this is an image generated in Kubrick. How many of you are prompters, expert prompters? Two, three, four, five, six, ten. Okay, eleven. All right. And you're very familiar with prompts, like these long Bukowski poems of like trenching your heart out, right? You, I'm very sorry that you cannot read this. I was aiming for you to be able to read this. Please listen to the prompt. A small pond in a tropical forest close up shot. That's all you needed to say in order to get this. Of course, if you want to write a poem, you're more than welcome. It was still yielding great results. But that was that, and then I don't want to see black and white in your negative prompt box. Here is another example. And this, this prompt was post-apocalyptic, destroyed desert town, wide angle shot. It's quite beautiful, right? And let us show you some examples. Kubrick, uh, this is the Kubrick base model. It doesn't have a house style, it's more, yeah, we call it the Kubrick base model. Kubrick Moody. Kubrick Classic. And sci-fi. You don't need to generate sci-fi. You can generate like towns, but it will have this same like grand, contrasty, wide, like, epic world um, effect. And what happens now? Where are we? We've been developing Kubrick since January. And uh, you know the feeling the moment you go to market? It's like you're rushing until that moment, but you need to do baby steps because it's your pr precious child. And uh, you want to really hold your hands of your partners. So we have, thank God, we really have the love of the industry. So we have uh, truly thousands of filmmakers and creatives that registered for our beta. We spoke to several of them, but in order not, not to disappoint anybody, we didn't pick and choose and be like, okay, we offer it to you and we don't offer it to you. We have to go very slow. So what we've been doing is that we've been, we've been like absolute total lottery. We've been picking like one person and we've been sending it to them. Okay, now it's your time. Are you interested? Um, so that's like our way of keeping our slow and steady progress. I will be showing you our pricing models, but how many of you have the experience of developing a software product? It's my first time. Raise both hands if you have more than two. Okay, that makes like, I would say 15 of you. Would you level with me if I were to tell you figuring out the right pricing model was much harder than developing that damn product? <laughs> yeah, it's this pain, you know, like, like as scary, like really, it's crazy. So where we are is that we had we had a great help from Chris Bird, uh, uh, one of the inventors of D3 that turned into this guy. So he knows a lot about pricing models and uh, everything. So he helped us a lot with our uh, with our calculations. So today, for the early beta users, we have uh, up to forty percent um, savings plan. So. Depending your level of commitment, it varies between $122 a month to $219 a month. But when our early beta stage ends, it will go from $156 to $244, $245 a month. But what, when we were um, researching this pricing model, we realized that there is this thing called token anxiety. Are you guys familiar with that? AI, pr at the end of the day, in Kubrick, every single button you push, it burns our GPUs. So nothing is free, you know, I wish it was free. So, but there are a lot of AI-based tools that offer tokens. You buy this token and then you run out of token. And when we interviewed like super users, they were like, can you please make a tool where I don't like have to have this anxiety? So Kubrick is unlimited. Whatever, uh, whatever you push is like, even if you're like pushing like nonstop, it's fine for like uh, 30 days. And so you may want to take your phones up because I will be flashing something for 30 seconds and it will only remain on stage for 30 seconds. This QR code gets you an entry to Kubrick if you choose to take that seat. And this seat will be available for you only for the next four hours. Why are we doing that? Because for us, you are 
You are our dream audience. You are our VIP audience. And we would love it for you. I'm in my last slide. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, last two. I have two more. So, yeah, and we would love it for you to start using it and uh, give us feedback. And for those that would love to test it before you buy it, we have 30 days uh, refund, 100% refund guarantee that acts as your first uh, 30 days of free trial. And if you, for some reason, you cannot buy it today, you can always go to our website to register your interest and uh, get your seat after our lottery. So thank you so much for uh, coming to my, I'm not done, one more page. <laughs> thank you so much for listening to me and understanding the natural forces, especially the force of love and, and having confidence in your weird turning an apple to a giraffe decisions of, you know, like basically, Believing in a reality where, where you don't need to see a proof that it will work. Uh, I would like to extend my thank you to a few people in this room that have been with us um, since uh, early days. One is Walter Schultz. I love you, man. Thank you. VFX supervisor. Um, great man. Uh, NVIDIA being our main sponsor since day one. And Nick and Pete, I believe they're in this room. Uh, our reps from UTA. Thank you so much. Our team today, this is our team, they're amazing. Give them a please applause. Our team is 20 people. We're all very agile, relentlessly positive and confident, uh, optimistic, and uh, currently we're raising, so there will be many opportunities to join our team. If ever you would like to have a place in our reality, please come see me or Gary. We would love to speak to you. Thank you. Wow. All right, uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna actually let Alan set up and